same. But we're just going to get to it. So we need to understand biblically what these words are and what they mean and how they're used in the New Testament. In Mark 119, we see in going on a little, see there's that English word again, same English word, a little farther. Well, that word in the New Testament Greek is oligos, and it means little, short, or few. Now we see in Matthew 10, 42, and whoever gives one of these little ones, that's mikros, where we get micro. So mikros, not oligos, is the antonym of megas, which is large or great, and that's used of size or rank. So in other words, the exact opposite in New Testament Greek of large having to do with size is not oligos, but mikros. Now, it's important to understand that. Because when Christ said you have little faith, the word there is oligopistos, not mikros, not mikropistos. So what was Christ saying there? He, he was saying short, you have a short faith. He didn't say your faith was too small. He said it's too short. It's not long enough, not enough distance. Remember the word for faith is pistis, and it means faith, belief, trust with the implication that actions based on that trust will follow. That's what the New Testament word means. And understanding the meaning of pistis explains why James said that faith without works is dead because it ceases to be faith. So it, it doesn't have any length. It doesn't have any distance to it. And that's why it's dead. So it is about distance. It's about length. He said to them, because of your little faith, your oligopistia. For truly, I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So when Christ's disciples asked him why they had failed to cast out the demon, and that's what this context is, he told them that their faith was too short, not that it was too small. Well, how can we know that? Well, first of all, we understand the actual meaning of oligos, and that's the word that's used here, not mikros. So we're talking about length here. And we also see that Christ would really be schizophrenic if uh, he makes that first statement and then comes back with the second one because of your little faith. But then he says, for truly, I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed. So Christ said, if you, you have just the most tiny faith at all, just the smallest seed of faith, then I can accomplish anything I desire through you. So it doesn't have anything to do with the size of your faith. It has to do with the length of it, keeping it in place and staying with it. When we see in Numbers 11, 23, and the Lord said, oh, his hand shorten, and that's kasser, to be short, to be impatient, to be cut short. Is the Lord's hand shortened? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. So God reminded Moses that his ability to reach and accomplish his word reach him and accomplish his word, is never the issue. His hand is always long enough. So we need to know and understand, first of all, that God's ability is never too short. That, that's never the issue. So it has to do with our reach. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. We see in James 5, 7 through 8, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and late rains. You also be patient 
establish your hearts. Establish is starizo, and it means place firmly, set fast, fix your hearts. So the secret to receiving the fulfillment of God's promises is to keep reaching out to him. And the key of faith, now faith, pistis, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And without pistis, without faith, it's impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists, as uh, ESV renders it, but actually it should be he is existence itself, and that he rewards those who seek him. Assurance is hypostasis, and it literally means a thing put under a substructure, a foundation. Figuratively, it means assurance or confidence or resolution, a steadfastness of mind or courage. Conviction is elechos, and it literally means that by which a thing is proven or tested evidence and figuratively it means conviction so here's the thing faith is the proof of victory already remember pistis is faith belief or trust with the implication that actions based on that trust will follow that's what faith is in the new testament this means it's all about active continual relationship based in trust which empowers the foundational confidence and assurance within you that God will fulfill his promises to you. When this confidence is accomplished in you, then you have the victory already. It's already there. And, you know, the thing with Peter and Yeshua was telling him, because of your short faith is really how shall that should be translated. What happened to Peter? Did Peter have enough faith to walk on the water? Yeah, he did. He had plenty of faith. If it was just a mustard seed of faith, he had plenty of faith to walk on the water. How do we know that? Because he did it. So what was the issue? The size of his faith? No, it was the length of his faith. He quit faithing. He, he started looking at his doubts. He started looking at the things around him. He took his eyes off Yeshua. And he pulled his faith, he pulled that little mustard seed out of Christ's hands. If you want to use a modern analogy, he took the plug out of the socket. The power was, and he started to sink. So the issue was not Peter's faith. He had enough. He had enough. It's just that he stopped faithing and he started focusing on his death. And, you know, the thing about keys, and a modern analogy again, is the same size key that the Volkswagen Beetle starts an 18-wheel truck. So it's not the size of the key that matters. It's where it's placed and where it's left. So if you put the same size key in a Beetle or an 18-wheeler, as long as you put it in the right place and keep it there, everything's good because that releases the power to drive the, the, produces the energy to make the thing go forward. And that's the same thing about faith. That's what Yeshua was saying. I mean, if VW Beetles existed back then, he might have used the instead of the mustard seed. But he's saying it, it has nothing to do with how big that faith is. It just isn't there at all. You know, if people have asked me in the past, you know, well, do I have enough faith to do this and all the other? My, my question is, do you have any faith? That's the only issue. Not is it enough, but do you have any? Well, yeah, I have some. Okay, then you got enough. So what are you going to do with it? Well, if you put it in Christ's hands and you keep it there, it's going to work. It's going to happen. Because that's what the assurance is. Faith is actually the victory, and that's what the New Testament teaches us. Once faith is accomplished in you, you have a seed, and you place it in Christ's hands, that's already the victory. That's what the writer of the Hebrews is saying. It's the, it's the assurance. It's the conviction. So if Christ tells me something, and I believe in him. And so what, whatever level of how large that amount of belief is, but if I put it back in his hands, I've already got the victory. It doesn't have to be there yet. It's going to happen. So faith is the victory. Having faith is the victory. It's not that it has happened yet. And so many times we look at it and say, until it actually happens, I'll we'll have the victory. Well, the New Testament says, no, you already have the victory because you're believing for it because God told you something and you agreed with him and you've trusted him and now you're keeping that trust right there. It's only a matter of time. And belief neutralizes unbelief. And this is the account, Mark 9, 24, where you know, Christ and the three had gone up on the mountain and the, the other night they failed to cast a demon uh, out of a boy. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief unbelief though in present will never stop you as long as you keep placing your belief no matter how small in yeshua he will see to it 
that his purposes are fulfilled in and through you. See, with Peter, going back to him, he obviously had doubts. We know that because he did begin to sink. But he also had faith. And he had enough faith because he did start walking on the water. But he began to take his attention off of his faith and put it on his doubts. And that's when he began to sink. But here's the deal. You're going to have doubt. The presence of doubt is not going to stop you at all, as long as you keep the faith that you do have in Yeshua. You're going to, you're going to hear the thoughts to be attacked. And the lie is that if you have any doubts, then you don't have any faith or you don't have enough faith. That's not true. You know, I've given you the analogy before on a football field, the, the object of the game is the actual smallest object on the field, and it's the football. It's moving that football up and down the field. And you have opposition. And so when a running back is in a scrum and, and they're at the goal line, the referee's looking for one thing and one thing only. He does not count how many opposing players are on top of the running back. That makes no difference. What he looks for is did, did the ball cross the goal? Well, that's the same thing with faith. The ball's small and your faith may be small. It may be like a mustard seed, it's tiny. It may be like a football in a 60,000 seat stadium. But God's looking at one thing. Do you have faith? Do you have any? And is it in the right place? So you're going to have doubts, especially when you start into something new. It's going to attack you, assail you. And you may actually have more doubt. You know, you have a, a living of opposing players coming against you. You may have more doubt than you think, or the size of the doubt may seem larger than the faith that you have. That's beside the point. Just take that ball and put it in the right place and keep it there. And that makes all the difference. Belief neutralizes unbelief. I do believe help my unbelief. And it's the faith in the one. So Christ. That's, again, I even hear that teaching sometimes, you know, if you had enough faith, if you just believe, you know, you're strong enough. That's placing faith in faith, and that's a fault. My faith is in I, It doesn't matter, again, how large my faith is. It's just, do I have it at all? So I'm not placing my faith in the faith. I'm placing my faith in Christ, and I'm leaving it there. And that takes care of it. It's faith in the one. And the anointing is what grows it. Remember, Christ means anointed one. Messiah means anointed one. And the anointing is what grows it because it's the spirit of Christ. So it, being the kingdom of God, is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. And it grew and it became a tree. And the birds of the air, Uranus, sky, air, heaven, the place where God dwells is what that means. The birds of the air made nests in its branches. Now, Christ is using a metaphor here that's very powerful. That God will grow even the smallest seed of faith into a great tree. In Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, talks about us becoming oaks of righteousness, trees of righteousness. But God will grow even the smallest seed to the point that his angels, who are like birds or beings of the air, they said the birds of the air can come dwell there. Well, angels are creatures of the air, aren't they? They're creatures of the heaven. So the metaphor here is that angels can find an active home there and they can come and go freely from the heavens to the earth. So what was Yeshua saying about that? He says, if you have faith, I don't care how small it is. You can barely see it. But if it's, really, if it's real, if it's there, and you place it in me and you put it there, he said, what that's going to do is I, my anointing is going to increase. And so he uses the physical picture in the natural world the tree is growing large enough to support its branches. But he's using the metaphor spiritually to say, but that's what I do. I grow you to the point that angelic happens around your life. And the angels of heaven can find well with you. It becomes very natural in the supernatural. Remember, angels are, they, they serve God. And they only God. 
And so recognize people who are agreeing with so that increases activity around you. And so God wants to grow you. Christ wants to grow you. The Holy Spirit wants to grow you. They're the ones doing it to the place where you become an oak of righteousness. And so spiritual human, uh, angelic activity is a very natural, if you will, thing in your life because you're doing what God's doing. The bottom line, the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of a mustard seed, here he goes again, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. The apostles wisely understood that they did not have the capacity or capability to increase the size of their own personal faith at will. And these are Christ's closest followers, and they said to him, you increase our faith. They understood we can't increase our own faith. Christ reminded them that it's not primarily how large one's faith is, but whether it exists at all and is acted upon in him. That's the bottom line. You can't grow your own faith. So just take that burden off of you. That's a lie from the enemy. It, it's a frustration. And it's something that actually can defeat you. It sounds noble. It may even sound biblical. I want to increase my faith. Oh, Lord, today I'm going to have more faith. I'm going to have more faith. I'm going to have more faith. And that's going to wear you out. And it's going to lead you to failure because that's, that's just not going to work. And the disciples understood that. You know, the more they're around Yeshua, they're like, okay, we don't have this. And we need it. And we can't create it in ourselves. So they pray to him. They ask him, you increase our faith. We need you to do this for us. And he responded positively. And he's saying, hey, what do you have? Give it to me, leave it with me, and I will grow your faith. And here's an example of this in John 4, 47. When this man, and this is the royal official who had a son who was terminally ill. When this man, the royal official, heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So the size of the man's faith, as well as a full understanding of Yeshua's identity and earthly mission were irrelevant at this point, completely irrelevant. The why factor in the circumstance was that the man took what little he did know and believe about Christ and he acted upon it. So there's no way this guy, he didn't understand really who Yeshua was. You know, he couldn't have given a theology, uh, a dissertation saying, oh, he's the son of the living God. He's a, he, you know, he couldn't have said all that. He didn't know that. He had just heard about him he's like okay wow this rabbi uh, there's something powerful about him i hear that he's healing people and so he has that plants a seed in him he has this little bitty seed and he doesn't fully know who christ is and he's not even coming to worship him necessarily as god he didn't have all that yet but he did have a little bit of faith and he had a need and so he put both of those things in christ he acted upon what he did have and christ is that outlet and so he plugs into the source the official said to him, talking to Jesus, Yeshua, Sir, come down before the child dies. So the man used the level of faith he had in Christ to bring himself to him. And upon meeting Christ, he then plugged his need into the source of power. Flipping the switch, Jesus said to him, Go, and your son will live. And believe the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. That is pistis. That's belief or trust in something or someone with the implication that action will follow. That's what faith is. Now, remember, we've touched on the fact that there's a really good lesson in this that this guy teaches us. Because all of us, when we have a need or a perceived need, and it may be completely legit legitimate, and certainly a dying son is a legitimate need. But we all also create how that need is going to be met in our own minds. And we, we approach God with that. Now, in this father's mind, Jesus is going to come with him. He needs him to come with him to his house. That was his prayer. Come with me. And that's not what Jesus did. That's not how he answered his prayer. So he didn't come with him. Oh, so, now to this credit, he, the Lord didn't answer his prayer the way he thought he would. He didn't answer it the way he asked it. But the Lord did answer it in his own way. And he says, you go. I'm not coming. You go. And he didn't sit there and go, no, 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 you've got to come. You've got to come touch my son. You have to come, whatever. No, he just took him at his word. 
and he left and that flipped the switch. So the power of God was activated in a man's life when he acted on Yeshua's command. We see in Jeremiah 1, 12, the Lord said to me, you've seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. See, Christ watches over his own word to perform it. We don't perform it. Holy Spirit does. Remember, that's what happened with Peter. Remember what he asked first? Because they didn't know it was Christ initially. They were terrified. They thought he was a phantom. They thought he was a ghost. And Peter needed recognition. He needed identity. Lord, if it's you, command me to come on the water. See, Peter did understand Jeremiah 1, 12. He realized that if God commanded him to do something, that God would watch over that word to perform it. So if he gets a command from Jesus, you know, Peter wasn't presumptive. Faith is not presumption. You know, when, when he sees Christ coming and he's wondering, is this Christ or not? Peter did just flop his leg out outside the boat and start walking. You know, he needed to have something here. And even though he's still got doubts, because there's no way that Peter just completely, as he's getting outside that boat, just was like, oh, this is going to work. I'm ready. I have no doubts and no fears. It, it wasn't like that. He goes, I think I can do this. And Christ commanded me, so I'm going to act on that command. And here I go. And he had enough faith. It was very little. Doubts are flying around. But then he starts listening to the doubts, and he starts looking around. And that's when he started to sink. But this father took the little bit of faith he had, plugged it into Christ. Christ gave him a command. Christ watches over his own word to perform it. He's gone. And it released in the spirit. As he was going down, this Power from heaven and continue to when Christ gives him the command, he takes him at his word, he turns, he walks, he starts heading home. Uh, his son's not with him, Christ isn't with him, he's by himself, but he just keeps walking. And before he gets home, his servants run to him and they say, He's he's doing he's doing great, he's getting better. This is amazing. He's like, What did this happen? It's one o'clock yesterday. He goes, when I was talking to Yeshua, bam. And it increased the light of faith. And this is what the disciples had said, faith, guess what happened to this father and his whole household? Their faith got increased. God did it. And he himself believed in his whole household. So the result of the encounter with Yeshua is that the officials' faith was increased by God. And so was that of those in the realm of his influence. This would teach them how to live each day for the rest of their lives. See, this father's influence affected everybody else because he said to his friends, his household, his family, all right, I, I hear you over here. I got to go find him. I, I, I think he's the only one who can help us. And so they all know why he left. So he, that's his influence. And so he planted a little seed in them too, and he acted on it connects with Yeshua. Yeshua tells him what to do. He comes back. His son is healed. So that little bitty seed of faith that he had, God grew. He's like, whoa, this is bigger than I even imagined. And everybody in the household is the same thing. So God grew their faith and it increased the light of faith. This is something we touched on Monday with our study of Hebrews and just jumped all over me. I love this word. I love this word. When God promised, He watches over His own word to perform it. He swore. It needs to be long. He wasn't perfect. He messed it up, messed it up around the edges. You know, he lied. He, you know, God never told him to take Lot with him. He takes Lot with him, and Lot created a lot of problems. I mean, Abraham messed it up on the edges all the way out, you know, and then he even tries to uh, kind of create a little, little thing of his own, and then there's a son that's Ishmael, and all that stuff happens. 
But here's the thing. He never gave his loyalty to another God. And even in all the mistakes he made, he stood to faith in the Lord. And so all of his failures, all of his sin, all of his confusion, all of his mistakes did not stop him from receiving the promise. Because the writer of the Hebrews says he was long-spirited. Because way back in Ur, when he was told something, the day he died, he was still believing it. Long-spirited. That would be my Cherokee name. Long-spirited. I love that. This is Michael Mayo. He was long-spirited. Becoming long-spirited is essential to obtaining the fullness of the promise of God. Remember, faith is the victory. Do you have any faith at all? Any faith at all? How tiny? Oh, it's little. It's, it's so little, Lord. <laughs> you can barely see it. Okay, but it's real. Now, what are you going to do with it? Well, I'm going to place it in your hand. All right, are you going to leave it there? Yes, sir. All right, then there's the victory. It's going to happen. I'm not talking about assumption. I'm not saying that you create the life and you're saying because you do this, it's going to happen and I attach Jesus' name to it. But when God tells you something in his scripture, our Holy Spirit has given you a word and it's been confirmed and you continue to believe on that, then the victory is there. It will happen because it's God's will and he's watching over his word to perform it. And you can know that. So faith means you have the victory already. Keep it in him. Be long-spirited like Abraham. Two things. This is Joshua 14, 12, and this is Caleb speaking. He was long-spirited, wasn't he? Whew, man. So now give me this hill of which the long Lord spoke on that day. For you heard that day how Anakim were there <clears throat> with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall drive them out, just as the Lord said. So like Caleb, even after long-spirited waiting on God's promises and faith, you still have to actively claim them when he creates the opportunity for their fulfillment. See, it, it's not just about believing things for it but when it actually comes when everything lines up and the opportunity for the fulfillment is there you have to act on it now caleb is not acting in arrogance he's not acting in selfishness and he's not acting in presumption when he says this to joshua he says it very confidently and the writer of the hebrews said that we we are in christ we come confidently before the lord so he's asking for uh, some prime land not because he's selfish but because god told him that was supposed to be his if he would be long-spirited, believe for it. And so Caleb has been over 40 years believing for that land. And so Joshua, Yeshua, and he's a type for Christ, same name, is the one offering the inheritance. We get our inheritance in Christ. Joshua, Yeshua is the one doling out the inheritance. So we have quite a picture there, don't we? But Caleb st stands before Joshua and he says, give me that hill country. And so he gets it, but you have to claim it. And here's the final thing. You got to pick it up too. He took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the cloak of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water saying, where's the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water parted to the one side and to the other. And Elisha went over. See, like Elisha, you must pick it up when your promised mantle falls before you. Or whatever it is God's told you, whatever you've been long-spirited about, and it does come, and it will, 100% of the time, it will, but then you must begin to steward in his spirit to walk over in the power of its fulfillment. See, the thing is, in the backstory on this, you'll remember, is that 10 to 13 years earlier, Abba had instructed Elijah to go mantle Elisha as his successor. You remember the story, how he found him working in the fields, and he puts his tallit on him, his cloak, his mantle on him. And Elijah understands, wow, God's prophet just put his mantle, and that was a physical cloak, but it spiritually represented far more than that. And Elisha was sober to that. He understood that. He's like, whoa. So he had a decision to make. He had a, it was a righteous living. He was successful. He was wealthy. How do we know that? Because he was a landowner and he had servants. So he had a good life, and he wasn't disobeying God or being evil, but he had to decide, am I going to take this to the next level? Am I going to do what God wants me to do? So he spent 10 to 13 years going from being the master of his own empire, if you will, to being a servant. 
you know, he's the one who gets up in the morning and gets the fire going. He go gets, he goes and gets a lot of water. He's doing all these mundane tasks, but he's also learning from the prophet all this time. Okay, here's the deal. When, when Elijah's time was up, Elijah had other spiritual sons. Remember, there was a school of prophets he was teaching. Any and all of those men had a claim on Elijah as their spiritual father. All of them did. And any one of them could have physically picked up his mantle. But it was God's will. His first choice was Elisha. The day that he's being taken, he has three different opportunities to do things that weren't evil. He said, you could stay here. You could stay here. You could stay here. And Elisha says, no, no, no. I'm going to go with you, my father. And he says, what can I do for you? And he asked for a double portion of his spirit. He wasn't asking to be twice as powerful. The double portion is the portion of the firstborn. So what he's saying is, I want to be your firstborn son, not because I'm arrogant, but because Abba has said I'm supposed to be. So he had other sons, but Elisha was supposed to be the firstborn. Now, the only way he was going to be the firstborn is when the opportunity presented itself, he actually takes the mantle. Because if Elisha just walks away that day, any of the other prophets could have come and picked up that mantle. And they would have stewarded it. So you've got to pick up the mantle when it comes. And remember, it's about the mantle. It's not about you. <laughs> when God chooses you, he's asking you to steward an ability that he gives. And Elisha understood that. The power was in the mantle. It was in the anointing. It was in the calling. And had Elisha not chosen to do that? So when that mantle comes, you do have to pick it up. And those are two points as well. So being long-spirited is essential. But it's not enough in that, okay, you've been long-spirited, but here's the moment, here's the day. Now, what are you going to do with it? Abba, Father, in your Jewish name and your Holy Spirit, we thank you for your living word to us. Lord, thank you for understand that it's not about the size of our faith, but the existence of it. Do we have any at all? And so many times, Lord, when we look at something that's facing us and we look at our faith, we think, gosh, it's small. And we look at our doubts, and they seem so big. But, Father, we thank you that we understand that it's not our doubts that are going to stop us. It's just a matter of whether we're going to take the little faith we may have and place it in you. Do we have any faith at all? Then it's enough, because our faith is not in faith. Our faith is in you. And so, Lord, may we all be long-spirited. Lord, by your word, by the commands in Scripture, Lord, if we will live by those, we can know that in your way and in your time, you will fulfill those. Father, if you've given us a personal word that you've confirmed to us, but it hasn't happened, we already have the victory, Lord, if we just continue to believe it, the long-spirited faith. So, Lord, we take the little key we do have, we plug it in the ignition, and that's you, and you have all that power and fuel and ability, energy, capability. You watch over your own word to perform it. Father, thank you for setting us free today. Thank you for helping us understand what faith is. And thank you that you're the one who grows it. You're the one who accomplishes it. You're the one who gets all the glory for it. You just, just allow us to be a part of it. And we give you the praise. She was name and by your Holy Spirit, Father.